How long does it take for a life to be changed forever? In today's case, the story of Mikkel Biggs, the answer is just 90 short seconds. She was there one minute and gone the next. Today's video is every parent's worst nightmare. The kind of story that becomes an urban legend which parents use to warn their children. For those left behind, Mikkel's disappearance will always be a devastating question mark. A precious part of their lives is gone without explanation. Is there hope out there for the Biggs family? And what really happened to Mikkel Biggs? Let's dive in. These days, people are jaded, and it's not hard to see why. The media, from the news channels to movie theaters, we see reflections of the worst in humanity. From this channel alone, we know just how twisted people can be. But there was a time before this, when the Night Stalker was roaming the streets of California, people were still leaving their front doors unlocked at night. And in 1999, the year Mikkel Biggs disappeared, parents still had faith their children were safe playing alone outside. The story begins on January 2nd, 1999. In Mesa, Arizona, it doesn't really feel like winter. The weather's warm and the sun is out. Two sisters, Mikkel and Kimber Biggs, are playing outside close to their family home. Mikkel is 11 years old. She's in sixth grade and she's an honor student. She dreams of becoming an animator for Disney when she grows up. Kimber is her little sister. She's nine years old and her older sister means the world to her. She looks up to her like any younger sibling would. Mikkel and Kimber are out enjoying the mild weather. They can hear the music of an ice cream truck calling to them in the distance. Mikkel has her quarters ready for the ice cream man. All they need to do is wait for the truck to arrive. But waiting can feel like an eternity to a kid. Remember those days? Mikkel is passing the time riding around on Kimber's bike. She loops around and around making big circles. Kimber watches her for a bit, but it's chilly when you're just standing around. She tells Mikkel she's cold and heads across the road back to the house. She turns back to see Mikkel still making circles on the bike. This is the last time Kimber will see her sister. Less than two minutes later, Kimber comes back outside to meet Mikkel, but her older sister isn't there. Her bike is, but the wheel is still spinning in fact. Mikkel's quarters are scattered nearby, but there's no sign of Mikkel, no cars, no passers-by, no witnesses, no trace. For Kimber Biggs, the feeling must have been incomprehensible. At just nine years old, how do you begin to understand that your older sister has simply vanished from your life? How do you move forward with such a heavy mystery weighing on your shoulders? Kimber runs home to tell her parents. They call the police immediately, and within 30 minutes, a crowd of a thousand people gather to find her. Everyone shows up to help, as well as all the local news stations covering the story. Detective Steve Barry from the Mesa Police Department is a patrol officer in the area, and he joins the search party. Later, he would say about the search, This one immediately was different. From the get-go, it was different. And he was right. There are certain patterns of behavior associated with specific crimes. For example, in the case of child abductions, the culprit is usually someone known to the child before the crime. It's only in less than 1% of cases that the perpetrator is a complete stranger. And in every case, you hope to have some kind of lead to follow, like an eyewitness account, no matter how insignificant it seems. But when Mikkel Biggs disappears, there's no evidence left behind, and no evidence often means no hope. So, where do you even begin to start searching in this case? In the most literal sense, the thousand-person search party scours the local area. They check every trash can and backyard. They look under every car, behind every tree. They ask anyone they can find if they've seen Mikkel Biggs. Within hours, hundreds of flyers are circulating the city. Mikkel's face is everywhere, with a plea for any information that ha might help locate her. Whenever a crime like this is committed, 
the first people who are scrutinized as potential suspects are the ones closest to the victim. In this case, it's Darian and Tracy Biggs, Mikkel's parents. Something about Darian doesn't sit easy with the Mesa Police Department. He strikes them as aloof and doesn't seem to re be reacting normally to the situation. But what does that really mean? Well, nothing concretely. When the police question Darian, it becomes evident that he's just dealing with his shock and grief differently from how they expected. No crime there. There's no evidence that suggests Darian hurt his daughter, and they move on. In this kind of situation, there's absolutely no time to waste. Every second in the search for a missing child is crucial. With every passing moment, the chances of finding the child shrink smaller and smaller. Police knock at every house in the neighborhood. Registered sex offenders in the local area are investigated and their houses are searched. Two blocks away from the Biggs family home, police question D. Blaylock and his wife. Blaylock is on the list of registered sex offenders with a conviction history that includes kidnapping, sexual assault, and molestation. Just the kind of guy you want living down the street from you. Dee's wife says that he was watching a Cardinals game in the garage at the time Mikkel was taken. It seems like an airtight alibi, so the police have no reason to look any closer at him. Plus, he seems like the perfect law-abiding citizen. He appears on the local news to talk about Mikkel's disappearance. He says, If you're my neighbor, and I see that you're living next to me, and I see something suspicious going on, I guarantee you I'll be calling 911. The police search his home the night of the disappearance, and they find nothing. Even with swift action and a massive search party to help, no evidence turns up in the Mikkel Biggs case. The Mesa PD track down all registered ice cream trucks in the area and interview the drivers, one by one. But it literally seems like Mikkel vanished into thin air, leaving no trace behind. There was no closure for her parents or for her younger sister Kimber. Even so, the investigation remains open, and so does the possibility of finding answers one day. In 2001, some new, terrible information comes to light. Mesa Police Department's attention is once again on D. Blaylock. His next-door neighbor, Suzanne Quinnett, told Mikkel's mother she believes D. Blaylock abducted their daughter. In rage and retaliation, Blaylock sexually assaults and horrifically beats Quinnette. Quinnette describes the attack. She says, He tried to stab my neck three times. He did successfully break it in one place. He put me in a chokehold. He choked me until I gave over and fainted. This attack isn't even the first time Blaylock has harassed Quinnette. She says, He was coming up on me. He was drunk. He reeked of beer. He was putting his hands on me in my yard. I called the police. I said, The guy is just creeping me out. He's stalking me. I've tried to tell his wife. There's really no question of Blaylock's guilt. He's charged and convicted for the crime. His sentence, 187 years. With this new investigation into Blaylock, it comes to light that he spent his marriage controlling and manipulating his wife. When the police originally investigated him for Mikkel's disappearance, Blaylock's wife gave them information she had been ordered by her husband to tell police. In fact, she had brought him sandwiches for the Cardinals game, but then he told her to stay away from the garage for a few hours. She has no way to confirm that he didn't leave the house during the time of Mikkel's abduction. This new information is crucial. Blaylock's timeline could provide the answer to what happened to Mikkel, but a sketchy timeline isn't enough to prove someone committed a crime. Even with this information, there's nothing the Mesa Police Department can do about Dee Blaylock's potential involvement in Mikkel's disappearance. All they can do is take some peace of mind from knowing that Blaylock cannot hurt any more innocent children from behind bars. Sergeant Kevin Baggs is a police officer for the Mesa Police Department during the investigation. He says, everything in my eyes points in one direction, and that is Dee Blaylock but I think it's equally important that we say it could be someone else. Until the killer, if it's not him, comes forward and leads us to her body, we may never get those answers. Kimber Biggs continues to struggle to come to terms with what happened to her sister. Children at her school are cruel and blame her for leaving her sister alone. 
In a television interview, Kimber would later say, I blamed myself for a while. I remember I was sleeping on the living room couch one night and my aunt came and she heard me crying and she asked me what was wrong and I said, it's my fault. And she had to comfort me. She had to convince me that it wasn't my fault. Five years after Mikkel's disappearance, her family attempts to gain some closure. They hold a private funeral for her and bury an empty casket. It eases the pain a little, hoping that wherever Mikkel is, she's at peace. Fast forward to March 14th, 2018. Detective Perry is now on the case, nearly 20 years after that fateful day when Mikkel disappeared. He gets a call from a journalist in Wisconsin who stumbled across a startling piece of evidence. Someone handed in a dollar bill to the Nina Police Department. Someone had used it to buy some Girl Scout cookies, and there was something disturbing written on the bill. In a child's handwriting was the message, My name is Mikkel Biggs. Kidnapped from Mesa. I'm alive. There's a flash of hope for Kimber and her family, but when they see the note, they know immediately. It's not Mikkel. Her name is spelled wrong, and the handwriting is not hers. It's just someone's poor idea of a joke. But even with this letdown, the Biggs family does feel as though they have some kind of closure. Kimber Biggs, in particular, is sure that Dee Blaylock is responsible for her sister's disappearance. It's not clear if he acted alone or not, but all signs do seem to point to him. He has denied abducting Mikkel many times, but amongst the denials, there are glimmers of confessions. But is Blaylock just toying with the police? Is this his way of keeping himself entertained for his life sentence? What do you think? Is Dee Blaylock the answer to Mikkel Biggs' disappearance? Or is she out there somewhere, alive, and waiting to find her own answers? Let me know in the usual place. I said earlier that with every passing moment, the chance of finding a missing child decreases more and more. But that doesn't mean they'll never be found. Much stranger things have happened, after all. If you know something, let us know in the comments below. You never know. This might not be the last we learn about the vanishing of Mikkel Biggs. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your support. If you enjoyed this video and want to be first in line for new videos, please subscribe to the channel so you never miss out. Also, please smash that like button and don't forget to share with your friends. It goes a long way to helping the channel grow and it doesn't cost you anything. I'll see you real soon for the next one. Thanks for watching.